we've arrived at chapter 11, chapter in personality. I think you're going to find this chapter very interesting. We're going to learn about major theoretical perspectives, uh, such as Freud, humanistic, uh, behavioristic, and trait theories. We'll uh, look at personality measurements, uh, such as the famous Inkblot test. We'll even maybe do that together as much as we can online. We'll also, uh, you'll be given the opportunity to take a few personality tests for extra credit, which you may or may not do, but I think you'd find it interesting to do it even if you didn't submit the results. So let's go. Let's start our discussion of personality with Hippocrates. I would often ask students here, does Hippocrates bring anything to mind? What do you know about Hippocrates? Students will often say, well, the word hypocritical or maybe Hippocratic oath. Indeed. Hippocrates not only is a person of medicine, he also studied personality and had his own viewpoint. He thought that personality resulted from the overall balance in our bodies, what he called four main body fluids, referred to by him as, in his language, the humors. Take a guess and see if you can decide what four main body fluids he thought personality rested on. If you guess blood as being one, you are correct. But what about the other three? Well, there'd be blood, there'd be phlegm, and two types of bile, black bile and yellow bile. So to repeat, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile in any order. Now let's look at one modern perspective of personality, that of trait theory. Read that first sentence for me and see if you might be able to guess what would go in those three blanks. When you're done, go ahead and click your next icon. If you were tempted to say thinking, feeling, and acting, you were correct. Now there are different trait theories, but perhaps the most recognized and for students, it's also the easiest way of looking at trait theory, is a particular trait theory called the Big Five. The Big Five maintains that there are five fundamental, five essential defining personality traits. Let's take a look at them. The first one, openness. Now you might think the word openness to ideas or experience. It is clearly, according to this theory, openness to new experiences. Think of how a person who is open to new experiences might meet an average day. They might take different ways to school or work. They might try different foods, go to a different coffee place, maybe listen to different style musics, try a different club maybe on each week. They welcome new experiences. Other people are low on this dimension. They like tried and true. They like familiar. If they go to a restaurant, they want their main restaurant with their particular booth maybe with their favorite dish. Next one, many students on a test will say consciousness. That is a totally different word. Remember we said in our first lecture too, consciousness is being alert, aware. Conscientiousness is different. Conscientiousness, maybe think of it as dependability. Before you leave your plant with a housemate, I hope they're conscientious. Before you leave their dog or your cat with them, I hope they're even more conscientious. Students love conscientious teachers, and it works the other way too. Again, don't confuse conscientious and conscious. Next one is the dimension of extroversion and introversion. We looked at this earlier in the course and we determined which one you were, or maybe you were in the middle. Please note that these are all dimensions. For each one of these, you could be at one end or the other. The next one, on many tests, students remember the A and they put aggression. And no, that is not a personality trait. The trait is agreeableness. The other end of it would be disagreeableness. An agreeable person is often accommodating, pleasant, good to be around. Next one, many students on a test will put narcissism. This is not the same thing. It is neuroticism. Neuroticism refers to a degree of emotional stability. If you are high in neuroticism, that's too bad. It means you are unstable. 
So I hope you are low in this trait. I hope you are low in neuroticism. That means that you are an emotionally stable person. If you might notice the first letter of each of these dimensions forms a word, and that would be a mnemonic that's very typically used in intro psych to help students remember the big five. But again, be cautious. Very frequently, I get consciousness, aggression, and narcissism, which will do you no good on a test or for your next class. Next, take a look at the theorist on the right and see if you can remember which approach we should show, associate with him. I'll give you a moment. Hopefully you remembered psychodynamic, or perhaps you on the go with psychoanalytic. Both are correct. And who's this famous theorist? Indeed, Sigmund Freud. And remember, Freud is one of those uh, 10 words which you must spell correctly for your teacher. At this point in the course, I would ask students, what do they know about Sigmund Freud? Any terms, uh, any emphasis? Students might give me terms like the id, ego, superego. Have you heard of any complexes associated with Freud? Sometimes students might say Oedipus or even Electra. What about his emphasis? Often students will say of sexuality. These are all correct and excellent responses. Now, of all associations on the previous page, they're all correct and should be associated with Freud. But if I ask you his emphasis, his main idea, or his approach as emphasis or main idea, in my mind, there's only one good answer, and that is the unconsciousness, or maybe you would say it as the unconscious mind, that part of our mind which is below our awareness. Freud extensively studied this. His theories and even his therapies all circled around the unconscious mind. Let's now consider three very Freudian constructs, the id, the superego, and the ego. Let's go to the next page to actually see the content we must associate with them. Let's now begin our discussion of the id, the superego, and the ego. Uh, that's Bailey, by the way, my rescue puppy. 12-year-old uh, puppy, though. The id is comprised of our irrational, instinctual urges. Freud emphasized, too, take a moment and see if you can think of what these two urges might be. One is quite guessable. Many people correctly associate sexual impulses with Freud. So indeed, one of the two irrational and instinctual urges is the sexual instinct. The other one, aggression. Both give pleasure, pleasure from being aggressive to others or pleasure via sexual means. Let's now consider the superego. It is our sense of morality, or in other words, our conscience. Again, spelled conscience. Lastly, let's consider the ego. Its focus is reality, dealing with the day-to-day -day demands of reality, such as our new post-COVID-19 uh, situation. Let's see if you get that. Consider the three images on the bottom right of the screen. Which one is associated with the id? Which one for the superego? And one for the ego? I'll give you a moment to consider that. Hopefully, you associate the devil image with the id. The person apparently achieving success at some endeavor in life, the ego, and the morality, the conscience, with the angel. Let's consider our discussion of the id, ego, and superego. Let's say that you have been working hard and you think you deserve a break, and you're going to walk down to the local stewards and treat yourself to a malted or a milkshake, perhaps. Now, if you weren't able to get face masks, apparently an easy way to make them is to take a paper towel and a stapler and a couple rubber bands, staple the rubber bands to your paper towel, which you fold in half or three times, four times, whatever, staple the rubber band to it, and now you have a homemade face mask. Now your steward's ready. So let's say that outside the steward's, you see a hot red sports car sitting there. Its top is down because it's convertible, it's on, its engine is chugging in that rich sports car manner. What would your id? ego and superego say about the situation.
Let's start with the id. So let me give you a moment and have you consider the perspective of the sports car sitting there, keys in the ignition. It's on. The owner is inside. What would your id, ego, and superego tell you to do? So let's start with the id. What would your id want you to do? If you said steal it, you're probably right. Why does your id want you to steal it? And remember, you must talk in terms of the id's urges. And remember, hopefully, the two urges. Well, you need a hint. Okay, sex and aggression. How can you be aggressive? Well, I think stealing somebody's property is an act of aggression. What can you do with it while you have it that's aggressive? Uh, maybe a little bit of a road rage, uh, chasing little old ladies across the street. Please, cha cha uh, please chase us down 890 and 90. Uh, perhaps uh, wreck it when you're done. How could you use it for sex? Well, maybe it is a hot red sports car. Maybe you could turn men's head, women's heads, both heads. I'm not sure, but it's got lots of potential for both sex and aggression. So your id definitely wants you to take it. Now let's jump to the superego. What did your superego say? Well, it being a moral center would say, don't take it, keep on walking. Or maybe you should go talk to that person that you, and tell them that they might be tempting somebody into a life of crime. Your ego, well, I assume if you're sitting in this classroom, your ego says to keep on walking. But clearly, there are some people in the county jail, state jail, or federal jail that might be in there in part because their ego said, go ahead and steal it. Hopefully yours is not arguing for that particular behavior. Now let's continue with Freud and consider the topic of the defense mechanisms. These are irrational tactics used by the ego. A healthy ego will be rational much of the time. An unhealthy ego, too stressed, might resort to these irrational strategies. Let's consider this list. There are a few more, but we'll confine ourselves to this list. Let's start with regression. Perhaps you know what the word regression means. It means basically the same in this circumstance, too. To regress is to go back. So in this one, the ego has the person go back and act like they did at an earlier developmental stage. In this point in the class, I asked for examples. If people have seen regression in their children, their nieces, nephews, their siblings, Examples might be a child that has stopped thumb sucking is now sucking their thumb again. A child that has stopped bedwetting is now bedwetting again, and so on. If you see a child doing regressive behaviors, you've got to ask what's going on that's so stressful in the child's life. It might be obvious. Maybe that child uh, is experiencing daycare for the first time. Maybe the parents have split up. Maybe a parent has been deployed, and so on. But regression is to go back to an earlier and safer developmental stage. Let's consider repression next. Repression is when a threat, it could be a threatening idea, memory, emotion, but when a threat is pushed deep down into the unconscious mind. Remember the Freudian emphasis on the unconscious mind. It might slip out sometimes, maybe a Freudian slip, maybe in dreams, maybe in mental illness but Freud believes that much has been repressed into the unconsciousness. Maybe you've heard of repressed memories of childhood abuse. They most positively do occur. Next, we'll consider reaction formation, the most fun one to talk about. In reaction formation, one emotion is turned into an opposite. So for example, let's turn to two movies, Shrek and Star Trek. Consider Shrek first. Can you think of any characters who seem to turn one emotion they had into a very different one? When you're done with that, move on to the example of Star Wars. And again, any characters that have changed their emotions into a very different one. Get your examples and then we'll see how well you did. Let's start with the movie Shrek. Can you think of the characters that had a strong emotion that was masking a strong opposite emotion? Shrek and Fiona would be a grand example. Acts like he actively dislikes her, but by the end of the movie, things have changed. And fortunately, Fiona had a similar reaction to Shrek. Shrek and the donkey. Shrek acts like he dislikes donkey, but he risks his life to save donkey when the dragon is trying to flame him. Even the dragon and donkey, she's trying to flame him, and yet, by the end of the movie, we know that there are donkey dragon babies flying about. Or consider the movie, the movie Star Wars. Virtually every character in there had a similar reaction formation dynamic with another character. 
Luke and Hans, uh, Luke and Leia, Leia and Luke, uh, Leia and Hans, and so on. Uh, C-3PO to R2-D2, Luke to his father and his father to Luke. So virtually every character had a reaction formation dynamic, changing one emotion into an intensely strong different emotion. Denial is the same in any context in life. Something too big, too bad, you flat out refuse to accept the possibility. Think of some examples of denial. Somebody denying that a loved one has just died. Somebody denying that they've been cheated on. Somebody denying to themselves that they've been fired. Maybe you share it with somebody you've been fired and they say, no, you're joking, you're kidding. They are in denial for you. Uh, perhaps that somebody has a substance abuse problem and so on. So flat out refusing to accept the possibility until you realize that it is indeed true. One student sadly shared with me that you're going bald because apparently he had recently moved out of denying the fact that even though he was a young man, he was in fact going bald. In displacement, an emotion is displaced from one person or thing to another person or thing. In other words, transferred. So maybe you've had a terrible day at work or school and you realize it would be unwise to vent your frustrations on your boss or your teacher. So maybe you are very difficult to the person in the checkout line that's doing the cashier job who might have had their own bad day. Or you give lip to the officer that pulled you over. Bad idea. Or you're home and you're very unpleasant to your dogs, your partner, your children. So I, all examples of displacement. Many fights over things like such as toothpaste caps and which way the paper towels hang are really displaced anger over much bigger issues. In rationalization, you offer an excuse for something that you've done, but it's essential that you actually believe the excuse. So you're not lying. You believe what you're saying, but what you're saying is truly not what's going on. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you are married and you've just missed your fifth year wedding anniversary. Your spouse is incredibly angry and you say, I'm so sorry I missed it, but I've been so busy now between normal school and work and now the coronavirus and the kids have been sick. I've been overwhelmed. You know I love you. As soon as this is all over, we'll go out to your finest restaurant. And you believe everything that you say, but maybe in reality, you deeply regret marrying this person. You deeply regret five years of your youth that are gone forever. Maybe you regret that your two children not only look exactly like your spouse, but are now acting with every day more and more like your spouse. So since this is too much for you to withstand, you say, I'm sorry, I've been overwhelmed lately. I forgot, I love you. Well, that is a big rationalization. I made that up when I was married, by the way. Study the definitions of the defense mechanisms on the previous page. When you're comfortable, do this activity, match the term with the example on the right side. No cheating, you'll actually get a lot more out of this if you actually do do it. Next, saying I forgot it and actually meaning it, but deep down you'd rather do anything else. Well, you have just rationalized. Next one, you had the rough stuff start in life, have no memories of before that age, apparently you have fully repressed them, they still might come back bit by bit, drips and drabs throughout your life. Movies that the characters have one strong emotion, change it into a very different strong emotion. Ah, that's hallmark reaction formation. Next one, you have a fight with your housemate, so you take your anger out on some innocent party, you have just displaced your anger. Last one, Dan here. It sounds like Dan is having some issues and having difficulty dealing with what's going on in that particular stage of his life, it sounds like Dan is now in the process of regressing. Now let's consider Freud's famous stages. Do you know what goes in the blank? If you want to say dynamic or analytic, that's a great answer, not a correct answer, but a great answer because that does show learning. The stages have a specific name. They're termed psychosexual stages. So let's look at Freud's five psychosexual stages. And this is Freud at his utter Freudiest, by the way. 
Freud said the first stage is the oral stage. Each stage has an area of focus. An oral stage, it's the mouth. Think of the baby, everything that goes into the mouth, the fingers, but also the toes. And if you're not careful, uh, pennies and bottle caps and so on. Before we go to the second stage, we must learn an important concept, that of fixation. So let's consider fixation. Fixation is just a fancy term for getting stuck in a stage. So let's consider what happens, according to Freud, if you're stuck in the oral stage. Any guesses? Maybe eating all the time when you're not hungry, uh, drinking all the time, or when you're not thirsty. Maybe always having to have something in your mouth like a cigarette, uh, a toothpick, a wisp of hair, chewing gum, mints. So always stimulating the mouth. Freud would say, ah, that results in oral fixation. But let's assume that you're not fixated. Let's go on to the second stage. The second stage is the anal stage. Very conveniently for students learning this, stage two is year two. You can see the focus of pleasure has shifted uh, quite a bit. Now let's consider uh, what happens if you're fixated in the anal stage. Freud said it could be two opposite outcomes, excessive messiness or excessive neatness. Excessive messiness, not wanting to give it up. If you think what anal means, not wanting to give it up, not wanting to make a mess. Let's assume that you're not fixated in the oral, uh, sorry, anal stage, and let's go on to the next one. Let's now consider the phallic stage, ages three to five or three to six. In the phallic stage, the little boy and little girl are thought to go through a complex. Do you know the name of the complex? Uh, Oedipus and Electra. At this point, please switch to the next slide because it discusses the Oedipus and Electra complex, and when you're done, switch back to this slide and continue with the latency stage. In the latency stage, like the other, unlike the other stages, there's no body area focus. The previous stage with the complexes was too much to handle, too much of a hot potato. So no sexual focus, no sexuality. Instead, the individual who would be in their early uh, elementary school years would be just focusing on the many tasks that need to be learned. Let's now consider the genital stage, not to be confused with the phallic stage. The genital stage begins at puberty, and the person stays in the genital stage, according to Freud, for the rest of their life. If you know the word latent means dormant, Sexuality in the latency stage, the stage before was dormant. Well, in the genital stage, the dormancy has ended. In the genital stage, it's a reawakening, a uh, rebirth of sexuality. But this time around, it should be in a mature, adult-like form. So for example, unlike the phallic stage, not directed at one's family members. Let's now consider the Oedipus complex you can't talk about the Oedipus complex without reviewing the Greek tragedy, the uh, Greek drama, which it was named for, Oedipus Rex. At this point, I'd ask a student of the class if they remember it, and typically I get a volunteer or two. In this Greek drama, the king was told by the soothsayer that his newborn son would grow to kill him and marry his, uh, his mother, the king's wife. The king is horrified and set has his infant uh, child to be sent away, to be left out to die of exposure of animals. But the person with the baby looks at the baby and cannot do this. So the baby is raised, becomes a man on the road, encounters a king, slays him and becomes king of the kingdom and takes the widow as his wife and the, pro and the prophecy uh, comes true. So now let's see how this relates to what every boy experiences according to Freud. The little boy of this age, three or four, starts to feel erotic, sexual feelings for his own mother. Now, if this is controversial now, think of in the Victorian era when people could not talk about sexuality. Even husbands and wives did not talk about sex. So this was scandalous. But anyway, the boy has erotic sexual feelings for his own mother, starts to see dad as a threat and a rival. And the boy starts to feel in competition with dad for his mother. 
But at a certain point, this entire scenario is too much to handle because again, as it draws to a close, the child is only five or six at the end of the stage. So this entire scenario is, think of a defense mechanism. It's pushed deep down into the unconsciousness. Well, which one is that? Uh, probably begins with an R. Hmm. Repression or regression? Hopefully you said repression. Indeed, this entire scenario is repressed, which is why probably the, the men in my class do not remember it. Now, people will make fun of this, but it is not at all uncommon to hear a little boy of this age announce that he plans to marry his mom. Most semesters, I have a student or two that said, yes, either their child or they remember the sibling, but the announcement that they plan to marry mom. If you ever hear such an announcement, you've got to ask, what about daddy? Sometimes, oh, daddy can live with us. Other times, if oh, daddy's got to go. But this is not an unusual experience. Let's now consider the girls' version, the Electra complex, in some ways similar, in some ways different. Now consider the Oedipus complex. The boy has sexual feelings for his mother because of her maybe breastfeeding, her attention is, uh, she changes him, she cuddles him, touches him, stroke him. So Freud said this was the basis of those sexual feelings. But all those things happen to the girl. Freud believes that the girl too has these same erotic feelings for the mother. And this continues until what I call the destiny changing day. For the first time in her life, she sees, she sees a male naked. She sees it for the first time. And she is surprised that it exists. And she realizes that some people have it and some people don't have it. And she's a have not. What is the it? Of course, the it is the penis. What do we call her condition? Penis envy. So forever forth, with this realization that she doesn't have it, she has penis envy. So at this point, she realizes mom also lacks it, so we're not so thrilled with mom. But who in her life does have it? Daddy. So all those feelings that she used to have for mom are transferred to dad, and voila, she is heterosexual. And just like the little boy, this is also too much to handle. This entire scenario is pushed deep down into the unconsciousness, or what was our term? repression. And this is why the girls of the course, probably the women of the course, do not remember their electric complex. And again, this stage is Freud. It is other Freudius. But just because uh, you don't believe in either the Oedipus or electric complex, don't necessarily throw out all of Freud. Who hasn't seen defense mechanisms? It's okay to pick and choose when it comes to Freud, just like a little buffet. Don't forget to return to the previous slide so you can review the latency and uh, genital stages. Let's consider the famous students of Freud, often referred to as neo, literally new Freuds, or post-Freudians. We'll look at four of the most renowned, Carl Jung, shown pictured on Town Magazine, Karen Horne, uh, no, it's not pronounced uh, Horny. Though with the last name spelled like that, it should be easy for you to remember that she's a neo-Freudian and not confuse her with, say, a behaviorist or a humanist or a drug <coughs> theorist. Uh, that's uh, Bailey, the rescue dog. We'll also revisit Erickson and add on, and we'll visit for the first time Alfred Adler. So let's revisit Eric Erickson. So we learned his first stage of development, of psychosocial development, that is, trust versus mistrust. Let's focus on the stage of identity versus role confusion. This stage is associated with adolescence. It's a time to explore oneself and build on the self-concept. Our self-concept would be all aspects of self, including values, goals, uh, perhaps religion, perhaps sexuality, perhaps gender, and so much more. Let's now consider Erickson's theory, the stage of intimacy versus isolation. Intimacy is not just referring to physical intimacy. It focuses on psychological intimacy sharing one's hopes, dreams, joys, fears, and so on. The unwillingness or inability to do so would lead to isolation. The ages associated with the stage, well, it would be young adulthood, so that would be typically defined as 20 or 25. And this may or may not surprise you, 
240 or 45. Let's now consider Alfred Adler associated with birth order. I always love this picture. I think it's so fun. So if you're familiar with the effects of birth order, that of what our firstborns more often like, middle children, our youngest, or only children, this work originating with Alfred Adler. Let's briefly consider some of the major characteristics that are often are associated with each birth order position, and you can see if you match your position uh, or not. When I think of the middle child, I always think of the Brady Bunch, and I always think of Jay and complaining, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. The middle child is in the middle, and often feels like they don't get their fair share of attention. And I asked my class, do you think that's real or in their minds? Well, it's real. Uh, loss in the middle. For example, if you have a family photo album and you're the middle child, or there is a middle child in the family, take a look at the number of pictures that have the middle child alone. Often the first child has a full album or two. The middle child often has just a few shots, often with other children and middle children get the hand-me-down clothes. I hope their older sibling was the same sex. They get the hand-me-down toys. So a lot of times they feel like they don't get their fair share of attention, and they're right. Psychologically, uh, they often are very socially skillful children because they have to navigate younger, younger children and older children and friends of their siblings. So often their asset is strong, strong social skills. On the downside, sometimes they feel driven to do things to stand out, to get parental attention. That might involve piercing, uh, getting arrested, changing religion, but sometimes they're driven to do things to stand out, and it's really not their fault, it's their parents' fault. If you think of the youngest child, you're thinking of the baby, and often the baby is always the baby. So they're the baby at 20, they're the baby at 40, they're the baby at 63. The baby is used to being taken care of. So whereas the first child was pushed and pushed to do their own things, to take care of themselves, to dress themselves, a lot of times by the time we get to the youngest, it's easier to say somebody in the family, take care of so-and-so, dress them, take care of them. So the youngest is often used to being taken care of. The youngest is not stupid. The youngest knows how to play the system. Let's consider the only child. Which position do you think they're most similar to? If you say firstborn, you're correct, because every firstborn is an only child for a while until the other siblings show up. So as the firstborn tend to be high achievers, so is the only child. As the firstborn have often social skill challenges, we'll say, so often does the only child, but a different set of social challenges. You learn a lot of life lessons from siblings, how to compromise how to share, how to forgive after a fight, and many more things. Now, if you consider who you date, firstborn, middle child, youngest or only, you might want to consider the birth order. Birth order. The firstborn, well, you might play second fiddle to their job, their achievers. Middle child, very social. So the middle child might come with a posse, so you might want to sometimes have dinner by yourselves, go to the movie by yourselves, but the middle child often has a posse. The youngest is used to being taken care of, so you might have to do things for them that you think that maybe they should do for themselves. The only child, again, with those particular social challenges, they might expect you to do, say, all the compromising, whether it's where you go to dinner or where you move or which apartment you get. They're used to being able to make decisions. There is no other children to compromise with. They can be grudge holders. They never had to fight and learn the skills of making up. So you might have to do a lot of compromising and making up when the fight really wasn't your fault. So again, consider the birth or position of the person you date or maybe even marry. It could have an effect. So we've been looking at personality. We start with the historical perspective of Hippocrates. And we so far have looked at two modern perspectives, that of trait theory and the psychodynamic theory. Let's look at another modern perspective of personality, humanistic view. We know much of this content from earlier in the course. Can you remember the two major theorists? No, they're not the B people. Remember the B people are behaviorists. Hint, their pictures are on the bottom. On the left, you see Abraham Maslow, and on the right, you see Carl Rogers. In terms of key concepts, 
Well, Freud was a half-empty sort of person, uh, seeing people as sexual and aggressive beings. The humanistic crowd are the glass half full people, human beings as fundamentally good. Part of this is our drive to self-actualize, to move towards our better selves, to self-improve. Maybe college is part of that internal drive to be better. The humanistic view is often associated with a hierarchy of needs. I often ask my class, have you had hierarchy of needs in a non-psychology class? And often I have students who have it in a wider variety of courses, these hierarchy of needs, everything from nutrition to sometimes business and many more classes. So on the next page, we'll consider the hierarchy of needs proposed by one Abraham Maslow. I also want to make sure if my students know the word hierarchy, a hierarchy is a ranking. Can you think of things that are ranked? Take a moment. Schools are ranked. The military people are ranked. Royalty is ranked, and so on. So basically, Maso ranked human needs. So let's see how he ranked them. Let's consider Maslow's hierarchy. The bottom level is physiological. Please note, not psychological, but physiological, though I would happily except biological in place of it, things you need for your survival that you cannot compromise on. Think for a moment and think if you can think of any of these physiological needs. Go ahead. Certainly food, water, shelter, enough heat, not too much cold, but also air, sleep, and so on. Mazo would include sex for the need of the species, but I would not include it for the need of the individual. One can certainly live without sex. Next, if you've met those needs, you consider safety. Think of all the things we've done today, this month, this week, to keep our safety or enhance it. Nowadays, that might well include wearing face masks and social distancing. After we've met that for the moment, you move on to love and belongingness. I do hope that you have love in your life. Belongingness is Maslow's term for our need to interact with our own kind, in other words, human beings, though a few cat ladies find that cats to be totally sufficient. A belongingness would be forming relationships, intimacies. Next, you'll notice it doesn't say self-esteem, it says esteem. Hopefully when our parents held us, literally they held us in esteem. They thought we were wonderful and cool and fantastic. We got esteem from others and eventually we gained self-esteem too. The top one, which we never really get fully, but can take moments of it, self-actualization. Basically taking our unique set of gifts and challenges and abilities and doing the most we can with them. Basically, to borrow an old army phrase, being all that you can be. Let's take a look at the behavioristic view of personality. I hope you recognize the two theorists. Take a look and see if you do. On the left, it would be B.F. Skinner with his pigeons. And on the right, of course, John B. Watson. I don't include Pavlov here because he didn't really look at personality whatsoever. Their emphasis, well, if you remember the other name of the behavioristic approach, you got it. Do you remember? Uh, it would be the learning approach. So their emphasis would be the learned aspects of personality. And just to review, would the learned aspects be nature or nurture? Hopefully you said nurture. Now let's consider personality assessment, a fancy term for the measurement of personality. Before we can go to individual tests, we have to look at two concepts, test reliability and test validity. Think of test reliability is the consistency, or if you prefer, the repeatability of the test. Whereas validity is, does the test measure what it was designed to measure? Let me give you a very unusual and real life example of a test and have you determine if it has test reliability or test validity. Remember again that test reliability is the consistency, the repeatability of the test, whereas test validity doesn't measure what it tries to measure. 
about oh, 30 years ago, a young baby was sickly and was taken to the doctor's office. The doctor did an examination and apparently came up with a hypothesis as to the child's illness. He then licked the child's forehead. And again, this is a real story. What do you think the doctor was trying to get information-wise from licking the child? Some students say the temperature. No, you could just feel the child's forehead to get the temperature. What's specific about the taste of the baby? Uh, sweetness? No, he wasn't looking at sweetness. Think of other basic tastes. Saltiness. He wanted to determine the saltiness of the baby, and very sadly, the baby was unusually salty. This baby was very, uh, later found through regular testing to have uh, cystic fibrosis, and as a very young woman of about 18 or 19, uh, did perish from this disease. Definitely a sad story. Uh, but back to our concepts, did this test, that is the doctor's lick, did it have test reliability and did it have test validity? I'll have you ponder that. Again, actually do do it. In terms of reliability, every time he would have licked the baby, he would have gotten the same degree of salt. So it was a very reliable test. Was it a valid test? Well, did it measure what he was trying to measure? That is, if the child had cystic fibrosis? Yes. It was also a valid test, though I don't think if he was still in practice, he'd be using it today. Let's consider our first test, the TAT. I ask my students to pretend it stands for tell a tale. It's a great mnemonic, but it in no way stands for tell a tale. It actually stands for thematic apperception test, but Let's pretend I didn't say that and just say tell a tale. I love doing this with my students. I ask for volunteers to tell me a story of what's going on. You'd be surprised at how many different stories I get. And virtually every year I've taught, I've gotten new stories. So take a moment and see if you can construct a few stories of what you think might be going on. Common stories include death stalking a young person. I suspect I might get a lot of stories like that in the current climate. Or it might be a Snow White uh, sort of thing where the Wicked Witch plotting. The person in the foreground is designed to be very ambiguous, so some people would in, uh, interpret this person as male, others as female, to facilitate better storytelling. Other people said, tell me, it's just a nosy neighbor. Other people tell me a ghost. And I always have to ask, is it a friendly ghost or a uh, unfriendly ghost? And it depends. It might be a parent. I see this person as a grandparent, very worried about the decision that this youth that she loves is about to make. Newer stories, including stalkers, uh, the living dead wanting the brains of the living. Uh, also, stories of multiple personality disorder. So you'll be given a series of these pictures, and for each one, you'll ask to tell a tale, tell a story, and these collective stories will tell about you, your experiences, how you see reality, how you see relationships, how you see the world. I love this test. Next, we have the ink plot, but since we're people of psychology, we must know its formal name. Its formal name is the Rorschach test. So below is a picture of a Rorschach. Take a look at it and come up with as many possible things that you see as possible when you look at the image. Students commonly tell me they see masks with the face facing to the left and to the right, kind of a melty sort of mask, or maybe a moth flying downwards, or the white center, maybe something like a, a bat or a flying uh, squirrel uh, flying upwards. Some people say they see two old ladies holding hands, though to me they look like they're playing patty cake. If you look at the white between the two old ladies' heads at the top, it might look to you like a rabbit hanging upside down. You might see the ears, the head, and part of the body. So. The person will see as many images as they can. The, the therapist will record it and then check the manual. The problem is that even with the manual, there are significant questions as to whether or not this test measures what it was designed to measure. Its creator, uh, Murray, had a hobby of making ink blots. What if his hobby was, I don't know, baking or crocheting? So if psychologists questioned whether or not it measures what it 
is supposed to measure, are they asking about the reliability or are they asking about the in questioning the validity of the test? Take a moment and consider reliability or validity in question. So for questioning whether or not the test measures what it was designed to measure, what it's supposed to measure, we are indeed questioning the test validity. Virtually there is always a better test to be used than the Rorschach, but we just mentioned for historical reasons. Let's now consider the MMPI. I always have my students see if they can guess the P, and there are usually some good guesses. Some people say physiological or psychological, but remember our chapter, personality. The I for inventory. So this is one of the used personality inventories on the market. You absolutely positively do not know, need to know the M and the M. If you're burning with curiosity, the second M is multiphasic. The first M is one of the states, or one of the states where it, the state where it came from. If you're thinking our neighbor, uh, no, not Maine, it's uh, Minnesota. But anyway, you only need to know the P and the I, the personality and the inventory. It consists of 567 questions, which you'll answer true or false to. Uh, so you've got to fly through it and just go very quickly. It measures two things, obviously personality being one of them. The other one is mental illness. It does give suggestions on terms of where you stand in terms of certain mental illnesses based on your profile of answers. For example, if your pattern of answers is very similar to a person that's depressed, you're probably a depressed person. If your pattern of answers is very similar to somebody with schizophrenia, it might well be that you have active schizophrenia. Or if your pattern of answers is very similar to somebody with uh, antisocial personality disorder, you indeed might be a sociopath. Next, let's consider the Myers-Briggs, which is an extensively used instrument both within psychology as well as career planning and other areas. You might have indeed taken one for perhaps a sociology class or perhaps when you did career counseling. You'll see that there are four different dimensions and each one has two different possibilities, a total of 16 possible distinct personality types. Next, let's consider the NEOPI. Do you remember what PI stands for? Personality Inventory. The N and the E and the O are three of the letters from our ocean mnemonic. Try to see if you can remember what they stand for. Was the N narcissism or neuroticism? Hopefully you went with uh, neuroticism. E that was for the extroversion-introversion dimension, and O, openness to new experiences. That would almost make it suggest like it only looks at the three of five of the big five. It actually does look at all of the big five personality traits. It just emphasizes th these three the most. We've completed the slides for this chapter, but I would like to offer you the opportunity to do a few personality assessments for both self-knowledge and a bonus, though I will say the bonus practice test still remained your strongest bonus and the most useful in terms of understanding class content. Uh, you can access these three tests uh, via the links provided. If you've already done the Myers-Briggs and still have uh, access to the results, just maybe do a screenshot and send them to me. That's fine. I don't need you to do it again if you've already done it again and can prove that to me. Uh, you can do one, two, or all three. Uh, send it to me in group messages. If you use email, you'll just get the announcement asking you to resend. I hope you enjoy this activity.